song. Thank you for those working in the sound room for getting this going this morning. We appreciate that. We have a nice crowd this morning to study the book of James. And I want to go ahead and tell you that my plans are to be with the Quintown congregation next week. They're having a gospel meeting and they've asked me to present God's Word in their gospel meeting. It's an honor for me to do that and I'm excited about it. Lord willing, we'll be there Sunday morning and evening and then Monday night and Tuesday night. And they've given me some topics on which to speak. All of these topics have to do with the nature and character of God. I'm very excited about that and I'm thankful to the elders there at Quintown for giving me the challenge of teaching and preaching about God. I believe, as I'm sure they do, and you would agree, that if we come to know God better, then we will love Him more. And we will want to obey Him. Whenever we love God, we desire to please Him, as we're striving to do this morning with our Bible study and, of course, with our worship. So We're so thankful that Brother Ray got us off to a good start this morning. And we miss those who are sick and not here. I know there are members of this class that are so encouraging and helpful to me. And, and Brother Jamie is one of those, and he's sick this morning. And I really miss seeing him and getting help from him. And so I appreciate you being here to encourage us. And I know Sister Sandra is still recovering from her back surgery, and we miss her and want her to get well soon so she can come back and be with us. And there are others that are struggling with health issues, and we're so sorry that that is the case, but we're thankful that we can pray to God for healing, and He is faithful to hear us and do what's best for us and supply our every need. And He's given us Scripture this morning to bless us with wisdom from God. There is a wisdom of man that seems right to man, but in its end are the ways of death and destruction. The Proverbs writer tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So this morning, we study the wisdom of God. We've been looking at James chapter 2. And the sin of partiality, which has abounded since the dawn of time, of course, was prevalent in the first century church. It was corrected as far as the Corinthians were concerned. In the book of 1 Corinthians, there were divisions among them. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, it was reported to Paul that there were some who were partial to Paul, some who, who were partial to Apollos, to the extent that they would say, I am of Apollos or I am of Cephas or Peter. They were partial to certain preachers. That happens in modern times, doesn't it? We have those who are partial to certain preachers. This is human nature, human wisdom. But we need to shun our human nature and take on the nature and the mind of Christ, Philippians chapter 2, 5, to have that attitude, that mind in ourselves. That's not going to happen by accident or naturally because we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, not being conformed to the world, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. So the book of James helps us with the sin of partiality, especially in James chapter 2. As we continue to read in James chapter 2, we see very timely wisdom. Of course, the Bible is always timely, so it's redundant to say that, but I think that as we study this lesson, you and I will agree that our community needs James chapter 2 now as much as it ever has. And our co-workers and friends and family members who have been drawn away by false doctrine, denominationalism, and those who would preach a doctrine that is contrary to the law of Christ, Contrary to the law, the perfect law of liberty that James discusses in the latter part of James chapter 1, that's contrary to the, the message, the doctrine that was delivered and spoken of in Romans chapter 6, that makes us servants, slaves to Christ instead of slaves to Satan and slaves to unrighteousness. That, 
that doctrine of Christ that Jesus said we could abide in, John chapter 8, 31 through 32. If we abide in that doctrine, we are truly his disciples. Then he said, verse 32, which is so often quoted and so well known, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. But we must abide in that truth wholeheartedly. This morning, we're going to look at James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. And the lesson that I am going to deliver is not from me. I didn't even come up with these very poignant points. As a matter of fact, this particular lesson has been preached here in various ways with the same main points, and it should be preached on a regular basis you may recognize these points as we read through James chapter 2 in the latter verses. Now, I, want, I don't do this very often, but I want to go ahead and recommend that especially men of the congregation and, and everyone who's willing and, and is, has this desire, especially men, take something to write with and go ahead in the margin of your Bible and jot these points down because there may come a time where you're teaching a Bible class or you're having a Bible study or you're preaching a sermon. It may be a devotional lesson for a youth group or at the nursing home. And you need to have a quick, very important, timely, point-by-point -point lesson, and this will benefit you. And that's exactly what I did when this was preached to me, and it has served me well. Because we're going to talk about three kinds of faith this morning. Three kinds of faith that do exist in our world. They have always existed and they will continue to exist as long as the world stands. And unfortunately, there are many false teachers in our community and all over the world that will teach that dead faith saves us. This morning, there will be men and women in pulpits all across the country who will teach that dead faith is a saving faith. And that is, of course, contrary to James chapter 2. They won't say it in that way, but that will be exactly their message, that dead faith is a saving faith. And James says, no, that is not true. We'll teach from the book of James chapter 2 this morning, not from denominational doctrine. Church that belongs to Christ is not a denomination. We don't desire to be. And by the grace of God, we are not. Because as we've been preaching on Sunday evenings, thanks to our ministers who are stewards of the mystery of Christ, we are part of a restoration of the Lord's church, not a reformation. We don't want to reform the church in any form or fashion. We want to restore what the Lord established and built, Matthew 16, 18, on a dynamic faith. There are also men and women all across the country and all across the world who will teach and preach this morning that a demonic faith saves. Faith that demons have will save. They'll, they'll preach and teach this morning with all confidence. It's a false confidence. It's a false doctrine. And they won't say it like that. But James will tell us there is a dead faith that exists. There is a demonic faith that exists. And these ways seem right to man. They make so much sense according to human wisdom. And they appear to be saving multitudes of people, but they are not. And the truth that we find in James chapter 2 is that we need, we must have, in order to be saved, it is essential to have a dynamic faith. And so we'll look at those three types, those three kinds of faith from James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. We're going to use the Bible. I'll be reading from the King James Version. And let's start with James 2, verse 14, where this inspired brother writes, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you... Say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. The Greek literally says being by itself. Yea, a man may say, 
Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect, and the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Likewise, also was not Rahab the harlot, Rahab the prostitute. Wasn't she justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? Finally, in conclusion, he says, verse 26, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. The Holy Spirit is plain in James chapter 2, verse 14 through 26. The writing of James, translated into English for us, is plain. It needs no additions. It really needs no commentary. However, we'll discuss James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26 this morning, out of love for our brethren, out of love for our community, out of love for God, Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men to listen and heed the warnings of God, to understand what the will of God is. Be wise while we have time. Repent from this denominational false doctrine, man-made doctrine that says a dead faith can save or a demonic faith can save. To teach the truth in love and speak it plainly without any uh, partiality, of course, without any uh, more love for our brethren that we, than we have for those without. As a matter of fact, we speak this because we have love, because we know the terror of the Lord, that one must have a working, dynamic faith in order to be saved. If, uh, Hebrews 11 and verse 6 says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. But the Hebrews writer not taking anything away from his writing or the Holy Spirit. The Hebrews writer doesn't modify the word faith. He assumes that we understand what kind of faith he's writing about there. He doesn't tell us if this is a dead faith that can please God. But what would we assume after reading Hebrews chapter uh, 10, provoking one another unto good works, verse 24? Isn't that what we're to do? And so, of course, reading the first uh, few chapters of Hebrews, but getting on into Hebrews chapter 11 and seeing that hall of fame of faith and reading about uh, Abel and Moses and all of those patriarchs, Abraham, of course, which we've read about here in James chapter 2, but those who not only believed in God but followed after His will and did those things which God commanded. Yes, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11, verse 6. And faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So there are things that happen as a result of faith that are very important. And I can't emphasize that enough. Of course, Ephesians chapter 2 says that the Christian is saved because of faith. And I want to make sure that I don't misquote Ephesians chapter 2 because I understand that in other Bible classes that are not part of the Lord's church, in man-made churches, there are Bible classes being held now that says that we are saved by faith. Ephesians 2, 8. But that is not what Ephesians 2 and verse 8, verse 8 says. So I'm going to read straight from the King James Version of the Bible. And of course, I'd be happy to read from any version if someone wants to bring it up here or read it from your seat. Um, I, At home, I personally, I read to my family from the New American Standard Bible because I enjoy it. It's easier for my mouth to make those words than these words. Um, but here is what 
the inspired word says in Ephesians 2 and verse 8. Let's listen closely. For by grace are ye saved through faith. Right? And then, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And I'll go ahead and read verse 9. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So we're not saved by faith. Faith is important, but we're not saved by faith. We're saved by what? Grace and what's, what's the word that comes before faith? Through faith. So what's the difference? Is that just semantics? Am I making too much out of these words? I don't think so. I don't think so because of what we read in other passages that we're going to see in James chapter 2. We are saved by grace. Now I'm pointing upward because that is God's part. We're saved by grace. Without grace, we wouldn't have a plan of salvation. Without grace, we wouldn't have a Savior. Without grace, we wouldn't have an ultimate atoning sacrifice. There would be no way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No, one's come, no one comes unto the Father but by me, John 14, 6. There would be no way, truth, and life without grace. So we're saved by grace. We're saved through faith. So that's my part. Through faith, that's my part. We're saved by grace, God's part. We're saved through faith. We're not saved by faith. We're saved through faith. What's the difference? Well, if I was just saved by faith, that sounds like something that someone does to me, you know? If I'm saved through faith, that's a process. It's something through which I go. In other words, I'm a faithful person, therefore I commit faithful works. I am believing. I didn't just believe once. I believe, present tense, ongoing action. Jesus said that belief is a work, John chapter 6. Baptism, by the way, Colossians 2.12, that's a work of God. That's an operation of God upon the heart of man. But I digress. We are saved through faith. And so someone says, well, I need more explanation there because those two words through faith doesn't help me enough. Well, that's why we have Hebrews chapter 11 and all those examples. That's why we have uh, James chapter 2 that we're about to read and so many other passages. So what does Paul say to other congregations in the first century and in different ways? Well, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7 says, we walk by faith and not by sight. So there's a contrast, okay? But what are we doing by faith? We're walking by faith. That's something that we do. We are controlling the steps we take. We're putting one step in front of the other. And hopefully, 1 Peter chapter 2, 21, mentioned this last week, we're following in Christ's steps when we take those steps. And Paul says a lot to the Ephesians about their walk. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools. Don't walk as fools. It matters how we walk. We need to walk in such a way that uh, we will glorify God, Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, um, so that when people see our works and our, we let our light shine, they glorify our Father who is in heaven. Romans 14, verse 23 says, Whatever we do apart from faith is described as sin. Whatever we do, doesn't that imply that we're doing something? Whatever we do apart from faith is sin. And I know I'm condensing that chapter just into one verse, verse 23, but there's a lot to read there in Romans 14. That's a deep, deep study. It may be for a different day. We're going to focus on James chapter 2. There are different kinds of faith. There is faith uh, that is vain, just like there is worship that is vain. Jesus said in Matthew 15 and verse 9, that in vain do they worship me. That's right, and we're, we're going to talk about those devils trembling too. Uh, but suffice it to say, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you something that you already know. And this is not a, a lesson in evangelism, but our friends that are part of man-made churches this morning, denominations, and that's what a denomination is, it's man-made church, 
They understand that James 2.19 is there. The demons believe and tremble. They know that verse. And they know that James chapter 2 is here. And they have read James chapter 2. So we're not going to say, well, you know, the, the demons or the devils believe and tremble. James 2.19, they're not going to say, oh, I, didn't, I never read that before. Well, let me just come to church with you and worship with you. And I'm going to just tell it. My whole family is going to quit going to this denomination and worship with you now. That's not going to happen. Right? That's not going to happen. So what we need to do is first understand that there are other types of faith and that most of these are prevalent. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, there is a way that is straight and narrow. This gate is narrow. And what did he say about how many people would find it? Few there be that find it. Few. But we preach and teach this in love, understanding that most people will not accept this. But we are going to continue preaching this because we want to build the consensus in our homes, in our neighborhood, and, and we need to start in our congregation with the knowledge that saves from James chapter 2. And we hope that as we teach, and all of us are going out and teaching one person at a time, that this, this information is getting out from God's Word. It's not our opinion or our information. It's James chapter 2. We want more and more people to read and understand so that more people will obey. That's basically what we want to do. We want people to make informed decisions, not just do what their pastor says, not have a false sense of confidence because the pastor said that I was saved, so I'm saved. We want people to have information so that they can make wise decisions based on the Bible and not have false sense of confidence based on what a man-made church told them saves. So this is uh, perhaps being recorded on YouTube. You're writing these very simple uh, notes down in your Bible. You don't really have to add anything to James chapter 2, but it's easy to see these three kinds of faith. And so what we're going to do is we're going to just outline them. We're going to outline these three types of faith so that hopefully they're as plain as possible so that we can see them, our community can see them, anybody who sees this can see the plain truth found in James chapter 2. And then if anybody wants to ask questions, well, that would be wonderful. Uh, we would welcome comments and questions, and it would just be a blessing to us. So let's talk about, first of all, dead faith. And uh, I'm just going to leave these points up on the board so you can see and follow along. This kind of faith substitutes words for deeds. Let's go back to verse 14 of James 2. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? I think most of the people we know will say that they believe in God, will say that they believe in Jesus, will say that they love Jesus. And that's a wonderful thing. And I'm glad that that's the case because it really makes it easier to live and work in this community when people will confess with their mouths Jesus as Lord. I love living in a community where you can talk about God to neighbors, which I'm happy to do, and I enjoy doing that. They're not members of the Lord's Church. Most of them, some of my neighbors are here this morning. Um, or really, I'm their neighbor because they were in the community first. But... Um, you know, it's, it's great to walk across the street and, and talk to a man who's working in the yard and, and say, boy, God's blessed me. And he says, he's blessed me too. And we can have a great spiritual conversation. And that can happen here in Adamsville, Alabama. And you know what? It doesn't happen all over the place. So we're very fortunate to have that. However, for those people who profess this with their mouths and who teach using Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, all you have to do is confess Jesus as Lord, and you'll be saved, which is being taught in denominations. That faith is not a saving faith according to James chapter 2, verses 14 and following. Though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? The implication is no. People with this kind of faith, they know the correct vocabulary. They can lead prayer, and they do pray. These people are kind and loving people. And of course, we love to be around them. 
They can quote verses from the Bible, which is great. It's wonderful. And we want to encourage that. But it is only an intellectual faith. That's where this faith stops. The faith that is dead is only in one's mind. He or she knows the doctrine of salvation. They know the law of Christ. They know the golden rule. They know the royal law. To love thy neighbor as thyself. They know the work of Jesus, and they love Jesus, and they probably worship God on a regular basis. But they have never really submitted themselves to God and trusted in Jesus for salvation. Now, they will say this out loud, but their works show disobedience to the plan of salvation. For example, Jesus says in Mark 16, verse 16, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. And they will say, you must believe, but you do not have to be baptized. You see, that's contrary to what Jesus has said. So their works are disobedient to God. They will say, I love you, Jesus. And Jesus would say, if he were here, and I know he would say this because Luke 6, 46 is exactly what Luke recorded that he said, why call you me Lord, Lord, but you do not do the things which I say. And in Matthew 7, 21, Matthew recorded that the Lord preached and said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who what? Does through faith. He who doeth, he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So if any man say he has faith, can that faith save him? Jesus has already taught us there are things we must do. People who have a dead faith know the right words, but they don't back up their words with works. And we are not saying this morning anything more than what James has said. We are not saying that works save you, works alone save you, any more than faith alone saves you. That's not what James has said. He has said it's more of an expression, mathematical expressions, faith plus works. An equation equals salvation. And so we are saying exactly what James has said. So let's ask the question that James asked. Can this kind of faith save? Can a dead faith save? Can a faith in word only save? No. Three times in this passage, James emphasizes that faith without works is dead. Look at verse 17. Look at verse 20. Look at verse 26. Faith without works is dead. Dead. So why do we call this first kind of faith dead faith? Because the Holy Spirit does. That's why we call it that. Three times, emphasizing it over and over again, James calls this dead faith. And that's exactly why we repeat the Word of God. And there are some that, of course, do not want to hear this. We need to also ask ourselves if we have this kind of faith. It is possible for a member of the Lord's church to have a dead faith, to say that we love God, but to disobey God's will and His Word, to say that we love what He has taught, but not to do those things, to say that we love what Jesus taught, but not to teach those things to others, as Jesus commanded in Matthew 28. Dead faith is a counterfeit counterfeit faith. It lulls a person into false confidence. Someone who thinks that they are safe, yet they are not. And this can happen in many different ways. If we have a walk that measures up to our talk, then we're in a much better situation. Uh, We've said that many times before. You, You know, you talk a good talk. But we need to have a walk that measures up to our talk. And really, it should be more like this. We need to have a walk that measures up to Jesus' talk, to the Lord's walk. If we have uh, dead faith, then our works will not measure up to our words. And we need to be careful about that. Here's the honest truth of the matter. We all love children and We all sympathize with orphans and people who are hungry and people who are destitute and homeless. We all sympathize with those folks, and we want them to be helped. 
but we don't all pitch in to help those folks. We don't. Uh, We all sympathize with those who are lost, and we want the word to be preached in the community, and we want the, the truth to be taught. We want everybody to be converted and be saved, but we don't all help teach. We don't. So we need to work on bringing our faith alive, and we can do that by exercising our faith. Listen to 1 John 5 and verse 12. Uh, well, let me turn there first. Let, I'll give you a quote from Warren Wearsby, and then we'll look at 1 John 5 and verse 12. So you can go ahead and be turning there. Here's one of the things he said. No man can come to Christ by faith and remain the same any more than he can come into contact with a 220-volt 20, wire and remain the same. And I think that's true. There's a lot more power in the Word of God and in Jesus than in a 220 wire uh, that's live, electric current. You can't be the same after that. You can't be the same after you get struck by lightning, and you can't be the same after you come into contact, real contact with Jesus, because He is an overpowering force, and He should be in our lives, a transforming force. First John chapter five and verse twelve says, "He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life." So what is John saying there? What, what, what is a synonym for not having life? Death. <laughs> there's, there's not a lot of in between there, if any. There's no gray area between life and death. So John is saying, look, if you have Jesus, you're truly alive. And if you don't, you are truly dead. And we don't want to be those with a dead faith. It's only intellectual. We have a lot of uh, very intellectual people in the Lord's church that know the Word of God, and I'm thankful for that. A lot of us know Scripture. Our children know Scripture. Uh, I'm thankful to our teachers who challenge my children to memorize Scriptures. Brad helped Asa. uh, Kyle and uh, Hunter gave Asa the assignment to memorize Romans 6, 23, which is a great verse to memorize Sunday morning, this past Sunday morning. Brad helped Asa memorize that. He had started, but Brad helped him along memorize that Wednesday night. So this morning, Asa has another scripture memorized. You're helping, and you are working, and that is good. But Asa has an intellectual faith right now. Asa's safe. He's nine. But he has an intellectual faith, and that's good. And we love that, and we want to continue that. But we're not teaching that that's all you need, and that's all that God desires. Because there's more than just knowing the Scriptures. And we're going to prove that from, well, we already have from James chapter 2 this morning. But let's look at this second type of faith, a demonic faith. It sounds so strange, doesn't it? But the demons have faith. They do. Satan himself has faith. He has come before God and spoken to him. Let's remember that, Job chapter 1. In other instances, this demonic faith, James just mentions fairly casually. I think that really he's trying to get our attention here. So he is emphasizing this so strongly to members of the church. That's who he's talking to. There, there weren't as many denominations back then anyway. So he's talking to members of the church and he's saying, look, you can have a dead faith. If you say that you have faith, but you don't do anything, your faith is dead. Well, what if you have a faith like a demon? Maybe some of his readers, James's readers, are complacent. And James is saying, look, this is not, I'm going to have to tell them more because they're not going to understand. They're not going to get this. So he says, even demons have faith. Demons believe in God. There's no atheists in this realm wherever they exist. I don't understand it, but there are no agnostics as far as the demons are concerned, as far as devil's concerned. They believe in the deity of Christ. Mark chapter 3, I think, now correct me if I'm wrong, Bible students, uh, I think that the demons were the first ones to call Jesus the Son of God in Mark chapter 3, verse 11. Does anybody know? Mark chapter 3, verse 11. Well, that's true. When he was a baby, there were those who uh, uh, called him king, but I don't know that they called him the Son of God. I meant the angel, of course, Knew that. But at any rate, it doesn't matter, I guess. Mark, that's a great point, Brad. Mark chapter 3, verse 11. And unclean spirits, when they saw him, they saw Jesus, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. Now, we have denominations that won't even say that about Jesus. We do. 
I've studied with them. Sister Chevy studied with them. They won't say that Jesus is the Son of God. They're in our community. Have a building and worship. They'll worship this morning. And they will not say what those demons just claimed. They won't do it. They'll say that he is an angel. We have world religions that say that he is a prophet. Billion people in a world religion that won't say what these demons said. Right? But the demons fall down to worship. They say, thou art the son of God. He straightly charged them that they should not make him known. Don't tell everybody I'm the Son of God. <laughs> They're going to figure that out. I don't, know. I don't know what Jesus' mind was there, but he knew what he was doing, but he told them to be quiet. Now, the demons know that Jesus is the Son of God, even though many do not, even in this day and time. They also believe in the existence of a place of condemnation, Luke chapter 8, verse 31. They believe Jesus would be the judge. Look at Mark chapter 8, verse 28. Now, don't get me going down a rabbit trail about demons this morning. I know some of y'all's interest is peaked because of this. Lost my place. Matthew. I said Mark. I'm so sorry. Matthew 8, 28. I guess because I was in Mark chapter 3. Matthew 8, 28. And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, there, went, there met him two possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? They not only knew Jesus was the Son of God and is the Son of God, they believed in that. They also believed that Jesus would judge them and that Jesus had control over them. There, there's a lot of faith in the demonic world, isn't there? So what kind of faith do demons have? Well, we saw that the man with dead faith was only touched in his intellect. And the demons are also touched in this way. They mentally acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God. They believe in God. Jesus said in John 14, you believe in God, you do well. Believe also in me. Well, the demons do both of those, don't they? The demons believe in God, the Father. They believe in Jesus, the Son of God, and all the deity, all the power that goes with that. They believe all that. But you know what? They take it a step further than that man with dead faith because they have emotional connections to that. Yes, they tremble. And I told you we are going to get to this. So the demons are touched in their emotions. Now that's an interesting topic in and of itself that demons would have emotions, but they do. They fear. They tremble. They, they ask Jesus, are you going to torment us? They can be tormented. And they fear Jesus, the Son of God. They fear God. They fear Him to the point that they tremble. This step is a step above dead faith. It's better than dead faith. Isn't that amazing? The demons have more than a dead faith. And there are a lot of human beings that have a demonic faith involving both the intellect and the emotions, the head and the heart. But can this type of faith save? No. A person can be enlightened in his mind, even stirred up in his heart, and still be lost forever, just like the demons True saving faith involves something more, something that can be seen, something that can be recognized, a changed life. Verse 18, I will show thee my faith by my works. Right? Being a Christian involves trusting Christ and living for Christ. You first receive the life, then you reveal the life. And certainly, God will be glorified because of that. He doesn't need us. But we get to be part of that wonderful plan. So do we have this kind of faith? Well, if we believe the right things intellectually and we feel the right things emotionally, well, we're up to the demonic faith. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> but there's more than that. There is a dynamic faith. And James closes this chapter of his letter. He's not done writing because he's, now he's going to talk about the tongue in chapter 3, and you guys have been provoking me unto that chapter all along. We're going to get to it, Lord willing. But uh, what kind of faith is this dynamic faith? We know from other passages that faith is based upon the Word of God. Now, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, by the Word of Christ, depending on your translation. Dynamic faith involves the whole man. 
Dead faith touches the mind, the intellect. Demonic faith involves the mind and the emotions. Dynamic faith involves the intellect, the emotions, and the will. So it's not just specific acts that we do. It's the voluntary will to do those things. This can be someone who is completely paralyzed from the neck down. He can have the will and the, the, the volition to do what God has commanded in whatever ability that God gives him or her. True saving faith then leads to action. It's not just intellectual contemplation, meditation, which is wonderful. It is wonderful. It's not just emotionalism. Some will have only emotions. It is that which leads to obedience. It is that which leads to good works. Ephesians chapter 2, I, I suppose we don't have time to go back to it. But we're, we're created for good works. And that is what we should be doing. To illustrate, James refers to two well-known persons in the Old Testament, Abraham and Rahab. And you couldn't find any, any two people that were more different than Abraham and Rahab. Abraham was a father of the Jews, father of the faithful. Rahab was a Gentile. Abraham was a godly man, a pious man. Rahab was a prostitute. She was a harlot. And Abraham was the friend of God. Rahab belonged to the enemies of God. Do you remember what city Rahab lived in? Jericho. Do you remember what happened to the walls of Jericho? God crushed them. Yes, they came tumbling down. So what did they have in common? We'll end on this note. And this is a good note to end on. What Abraham and Rahab were so different, but what did they have in common? Their faith. Their faith. And it was a dynamic faith. It wasn't just... Rahab didn't just say, you know, to those spies, she didn't say, well, I know there's a God, and I know he's the true God, but whatever happens, happens. And she had emotion. She said, you know what? We know there's a God, and we, we're, in, we're afraid of God. We know what happened in Egypt, and we tremble in fear. She had that demonic faith, but she had a dynamic faith. She hid the spies. She did something to be part of God's plan. And God revealed that about her character to us. Now, was she a perfect person? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But God wanted to show us what is pleasing to Him in our lives. It's what we can do today and right now. We can intellectually and emotionally know God, but we can do something, and God gives us the opportunity and the ability right now to do those things which He's commanded. I hope this lesson has helped you this morning. Please take it and teach it to others. From James chapter 2.